virtual farmers and builders. How are you all doing? Thanks for clicking and welcome to today's build. It's been a while since I've seen cruise ship ads and I thought I'd give a shot at it. I gave up on cable TV a while ago for streams and YouTube content so now I just get targeted with ads for cars and games. Today's build is the Garden Voyage Cruiser, a passenger luxury ship that's island bound for garden paws. A cutesy sandbox game is a shopkeep that develops a small town and fuzzy animals. Maybe you already know about Frank, the notoriously needy NPC. Or how about Conrad? He's decided to hang out on the island of Cozita where I parked this boat build. And why is he so awkward? Anyway, we'll transition over here in a moment to creative mode because the initial build of this boat went through four to five different variations to get to its current state. I was like, hmm, not big enough. Mm, still not big enough. Okay, it just looks like an industrial barge now. I spent the next 20 minutes annoyed with how it didn't really fit in the whole scene, but I really had just been wanting to try a boat project and do a glass bottom on it and all, since these pieces exist to do it. Determination overruled better judgment to go to bed, and I decided to see what using a curve ramp in piece might look like. It changed like dominoes from there into trying to match pieces together like a puzzle until it came out like this. Most of this wasn't recorded, so instead what I'm gonna do is rebuild the whole of the boat in creative for hopefully a clearer explanation, the clearest what I can do at least. Hopefully it helps you get one of these sea crafts together if you're wanting one of your own for shore decorations. You can find more Garden Paws building and tip videos on the channel if you're interested. There's also an assortment of game reviews and short guides for other titles that share some similarities. Building in this game doesn't seem to get old though, so you can expect the playlist will still get updates. Now that we're in creative mode, getting to the boat, its location takes a little foundation surfing. What you have to do is find an approximate spot on the shore to place your first foundation, hop on it, and then using the item shifter, lock on and power shift yourself out to sea until you're satisfied with your final destination. Take a swim around the area that you want to build and make sure you have clearance. I actually ran up against the end of the map when building back on the boat. Still able to shift items into place, but unable to walk all the way to the very corner. It's not a huge deal, but it did force me to shift the build forward after being into the second floor of the build. There were many remodels that it went through. You can use the chapters to skip around or ahead to different sections if you need to. There are some time lapse portions. If review is needed, you can always mute and use the slider to change the video speed. This design starts with 20 glass foundations lined up side by side and adjoined to the base are rows of glass ramps to create the sides of the hull. One could also use wooden foundation and ramps in place of these for a different look. Hopefully this is easy going and the items are snapping together nicely lined up. At this point, it's basically like building the roof of a house but just upside down. For this portion we'll need corner plaster walls curved ramps in and curved ramps out. A puzzle combination of these will give a shape to the front and a rear of the boat, but one could also option for a more original barge design to construct a base. I'll do a separate set of short instructions for it following this one. It is an easier option. There's also a chapter option to skip ahead if that's the specific design you're looking for. For the shaped hull designers, ramps can be placed for the bow of the ship at the front all the way to the stern, except for the last row of foundations. Here, place two of the curved ramp out pieces obtained from the NPC Roman and that you can craft at the main workbench. Rotate to line up with the foundations. On each side, place two corner walls and then rotate upside down and shift over to meet the seam of the curved ramp. Directly off the back, one can opt to use wooden ramps or glass ramps to shape the stern base. 
I've gone with a combination of bowls plus short walls for trim. Now it's time for the bow. If you're doing this in creative, you can use the ease of the jetpack for this project, but if you're doing it in story mode, give yourself some room to work and see by shifting around the front parts. The drone camera can be helpful. You can still see the arrow of your item shifter's direction from the drone so that you can adjust from far away. Across the front foundations, there's two plaster walls and two corner plaster pieces rotated upside down. You may want to leave these unplaced until after finishing the bow, or leave them out altogether as they were just a design choice. At the farthest point of both ends, start with the curved ramp in to create the cone. This is connected to a curved ramp out that's also rotated to line up with the plaster walls, followed by another curved ramp in. By the time you're done, both ends should meet hopefully and line up fairly well, leaving you with a little bit more shapely bow. We're about to do the foundations for the next deck. At this point, it's a good idea to think about where to put your staircases, because when we built to the floor above, you might end up wanting a different floor plan or your paths to get around to rooms. I placed one at the front and back on the very bottom floor of the ship. Through most of the floor that remains the same, from aside from the double staircases at the upper deck. There's a ways to go before that, but you will need to find some place to put your staircases. There's been a few moments when I've placed one only to realize that I've created the Winchester Mystery House and I'm staring into a staircase to nowhere, or directly into a wall. And if you don't know what the Winchester Mystery House is, it's an architectural creation by the wife of famous gunmaker William Winchester. I say creation because it's really bizarre, with over 150 rooms of awkward staircases that are optical illusions, doors that open to courtyards but only several stories off the ground, and there's no balcony to catch you, so it's kind of like a horror house, hence the mystery in its name. It was said that Sarah was instructed by her spiritual medium type advisor to endlessly build for the dead spirits of people her husband's rifles had killed. At the same time of its strange past, the place is vast and a sprawling landscape with yards yet while still being stuck right in the middle of a commercial area of San Jose, California, the world's busiest tech bro hub. It's quite extensive throughout the massive building that has two ballrooms, 40 bedrooms, 47 fireplaces, and three elevators, which was pretty interesting considering that this was the 1880s. I took a tour through there once during Christmas time, and the whole thing was decorated with Christmassy themes, which kind of took the horror right out of the entire experience. They even included the snow in San Jose, in this little 4.5 acre patch of snowy bliss. Hmm. The more I talk about it, it is perhaps a future building recreation time, if I need for some reason to get possessed by fuzzy creatures' cuteness because this game is too fun. All 150 rooms, though? Maybe not that. I don't even know if I have an island big enough. That's a lot of foundation. Okay. Here's where you might want to consider things like you want to consider your end design to look. The original there's a few altered plastered walls with some windows. I was trying for that port window look on the lower cabin deck, but ultimately you could go with a lot of different boat styles. Even straight up pirate ship. Skip the glass altogether, completely revamp the top decks, use the pillars for masts, and maybe, I don't know, custom rug for sails somehow? Okay, maybe I'm going to have to work on that and see if I can actually pull it off. Make a line of walls, windows, and glass, or whatever you might like to use, all the way down the both sides of this existing foundation. Starting at the back of the boat, to extend the stern about a little more, we're going to use another set of ramps and a material of your choice. Four of them. To connect the back ramps to the walls, we just need to place some corner plaster walls on both sides and then use that item shifter to rotate and adjust them into place. I'm going to race back up to the front of the boat now. 
and finish up on the top of the cruiser's bow. Now, in a repeat of what we did on the back, but the corner plaster wall pieces get rotated and pointed into an opposite direction. Adjoined to this, we'll need a curved ramp out piece. Next to that, we need a curved ramp in piece. The two ramps in the front will give us a nice deck by the time it's done. The same procedure is on the opposite side, so let's pause for some blueprint recap here before putting in the final top deck. More stairs, more foundations here. Building this one's a marathon, but we will prevail. Rewind a quick second here for the folks who wanted more of a barge look before we move on to the top section of the boat. For the shape hole designed watchers, you won't be missing much if you skip ahead to the next chapter. Start with 33 wooden or glass foundations in rows of three, and then line both sides completely with ramps of either option. At each end, place four ramps. This leaves only the gap left for the corner wall pieces that can be rotated and shifted into that gap. Put stairs and foundations into place and then start lining the ship with your wall choices. Like the lower floor, ramps go along the back and the front of the boat using corner wall plaster or glass to close that gap. Another layer of foundations, and the barge deck is done. Alright, now is a good time to commit to some end goal design plans. For the purpose of this instruction video, I'm going to go ahead and rebuild the same exterior as my original experiment to hopefully make this video easier to follow than the mess that was recorded the first time when I really had no plan. If you're following along closely, we'll need some plaster walls, walls with windows and doors in addition to some glass. Oh, and some short walls in there too. You can fiddle with this configuration however you like, adjust to the kinds of rooms that you want your boat to have. Trying to get a bit of shape, I have walkway decks built in and the front is more tapered in the design incorporating some of the triangle foundations. Both sides were kept identical on this floor so that the pattern can be repeated when building down both sides. One can always use the hammer later on to remove and replace walls as necessary to accommodate their remodeling. The triangle foundation trick helps you line up walls without having to do it manually by the item shifter. Put down a temporary piece and then use two overlapping walls over the top before removing the triangle with the hammer then finish up with a nice glass display front. This will eventually get a bit of an awning to shade the deck, but for now, let's find some place for stairs and lay foundations for that next level. Basically, it's the same material as from the last floor, but this time slightly different shape in the rear with the outer staircase to the upper deck. There is, however, also a captain's cabin at the front that has its own observation decks. 
This portion was raised up and doesn't follow the exact formula as usual. At the end of this hallway, we widen back out again like the last floor. On one side there will be a plaster wall connected to the glass, and at a 90 degree place the exit door to the walkway, then the glass and plaster wall. On the opposite side hallway, connect a plaster wall with a door and another plaster wall next to it. Going around with your choice of materials until you've built a small closet. Finish it off with the door to the walkway. This keeps a pretty uniform structure going all the way up. That leaves only this last part to raise up. The last three spaces to the end will be short walls through the center all the way to that front. On top of the short walls, running through the center, stack glass walls and doors on both sides, followed by corner glass pieces. At the very front, use two glass ramps. This gives the captain area a high ceiling and panoramic view. Short walls to create the trim and shore up the height so that a combination of big and little stairs can be used to reach the top deck. This takes a little bit of shifting things around depending upon how perfectionist you want to get here. There's a stack of short walls that line up the top of the glass and the row stacked above it. At each end, a half wall should line up to crown the top of the cabin. Continue using the wooden regular and standard foundations to create the deck pattern leaving one space above where your stairs are going to go. This way your interior staircase can be placed next to the door and you'll have space to put in smaller sets of stairs to the top. The rest of these gaps can all be filled with half walls. You're in the home stretch of building the main structure at this point because the top deck is just a little booth topped with a tent. To further extend the midsection or to give more space for something like a pool, you can line with half wooden foundations. 
add to your side staircases and you're done with the main bit. Now this is a short break while I grab coffee and I'll uh, let some of this uh, build footage finish. If you want, you can go back and trim parts with the wooden pillars, that is if you have the patience. I only did it around the uh, captain's cabin or trim around the boat's edges and rooms. It will definitely need some railings or other barriers, unless you'd like to have characters falling off the sides into the waters below. So here's where you use some short walls or different fence options that fit in nicely. You can even go with some more decorative fences from the garden furniture set. They seem to line up fairly well with the stone staircases for guardrails. But it does need some cohesion to the exterior, in other words, a paint job. So it's time to get out the brushes for at least to refinish the walls and floors. Depending upon what style of boat you ended up going with, from the cruise liner, pirate, or otherwise, there's probably a few options, particularly on the wood paintbrush. But really, it could be a rainbow ship too if you wanted. Interior walls come down to what kind of amenities you want the boat to have. In the original, it had a collection of passenger rooms and a whole lot of eateries along with the spa at the bottom. This one's probably getting a similar spa treatment, but on the mid-deck, I may go for something entirely different than the initial tavern and passenger rooms. Using carts in almost everything is my goal, so I'm going to attempt a small indoor track, which may mean remodels. Anything can mean remodels with trying to think up some new features, but the trampoline is still going on the bow and the pool on the roof. Ultimately, you can choose whatever you can squeeze onto this thing. It could be an entirely different kind of boat that has varied cargo. Though the course of this build, there were other watercraft creativity possibilities that came to mind, so I may have some alternate boat builds for the future. And if that interests you, check out the channel and maybe subscribe for some upcoming builds. And this build, uh, is hippocampus bending to say the least. The first time it started out with a massive flat-sided barge and got stripped down piece by piece like a sculpture into a final product. There can be a few moments like this in Garden Paws, but otherwise it's a fairly relaxing game. While doing some decorating time lapse, we'll, uh, how about checking out this podcast about how gaming can help with de-stressing in life? That sounds like a good one. I think if there's been one gift to humanity from the world of video games and video game research, it has been that we better understand now a lot of ways that non-pharmaceutically we can alter our brain state and then we can alter our mood. That is a gift. 
It's Note to Self, the tech show about being human. I'm Anoush Samarodi. And on this episode, are there good and bad games? Is it ever okay to play that game that you feel like is a total time suck? What kind of limits should we put on ourselves? What about our kids? Are they learning something from all those hours with that PlayStation? And if you're not much of a gamer, why would you ever want to get into playing? As many of you who listen to this show know, I am not much of a gamer. But after talking to this woman, I don't know, I might start picking up the console. Because this woman says that video games are the new self-help. I am Jane McGonigal. I'm the director of game research and development at the Institute for the Future in Palo Alto, California. Okay, the Institute for the Future. Yes, this is a real place. And what they try to do is blow people's minds with ideas about how the world could be different with new technology, new models of thinking. And Jane joined the group after she finished her Ph.D. in performance studies at Berkeley. She became an expert in how games, specifically video games, can make us more imaginative, smarter, both as individuals and collectively, as communities, as societies. So I actually met Jane over the summer at an event and um, I really liked her because I was like, I said the word gamification and she looked at me and wrinkled her nose with disgust. And she was like, that is not what I do. And I was like, okay. And after I found out what she does do, I knew I had to have her on to really explore more deeply some of her philosophies about not just anxiety and coping mechanisms, but actually how video games can make us better, more powerful people. What I'm really interested in is looking at the neurochemical changes that happen when we're in a state of play. And I try to help people figure out how to create those positive emotions and that resilient way of thinking to real-life problems. You don't have to turn something into a game in order to activate that super-empowered, hopeful mindset to be better able to control your attention or to be more determined in the face of extreme challenge, better able to handle pressure. You just need to understand how your brain works when you play games and what are the sort of secret hacks to doing that in everyday life. And when I make a game... I'm trying to do that for people, but you can also learn to do it for yourself. You've talked about in both of your books, Super Better and Reality is Broken, about how games, specifically video games, can be linked to coping with depression and anxiety. Can you explain Mm -hmm. what is going on in our brains? Mm. Well, my favorite research finding from the hundreds of years that human beings have been studying play and games is from Brian Sutton Smith, who's a renowned psychologist of play. And he once said that the opposite of play isn't work. The opposite of play is depression. Mm. And that is true both at an intuitive level. You know, when we play games, we're optimistic about our ability to improve and get better. We have a lot of physical energy. We have access to positive emotions like excitement and pride in our accomplishments and joy and curiosity and wonder. And we have an easier time reaching out to other people when we're playing a game and they're playing it with us. We have common ground and shared attention. When you reverse all of those things, it's literally the clinical definition of depression. But more recently, fMRI research has shown us that at a neurological level, depression and video game play in particular are literally opposite. So the same two regions of the brain that tend to be chronically understimulated when we're depressed are chronically hyperstimulated when we play video games. And that to me is one of the most important things to understand right now because one, it explains why many people self-medicate depression and anxiety Mm. with video games. And it can help us understand maybe ways that they could use games more effectively so that they're not just avoiding reality or they're not creating addictions for themselves. And it can also help us in stressful situations uh, if we need that extra boost of motivation and optimism and the ability to learn and improve. But I guess I worry that often we use video games to numb ourselves. So playing Mm -hmm. a game to sort of 
keep my mind occupied so I'm not ruminating. That makes sense to mm-hmm. me. But then there's another part of me that's like, well, why don't you just focus on why you feel so uncomfortable with this decision and try to work through at that? Yeah, I mean, that's really interesting. I think it depends on how you feel about the source of anxiety or depression. If you practice cognitive behavioral therapy, which a lot of super better draws on, one of the beliefs of that system is that you don't have to take all of your thoughts and feelings seriously, that just mm-hmm. because they pop up in your mind doesn't mean that they are real or matter. So just because your brain is telling you that you're upset about something or that something feels bad, I mean, it's not necessarily something that requires your time and energy and effort. You can choose to ignore it, which is also the same principle of meditation. The thought comes into your head. You say, thank you, mind, and I'm going to push it aside. I think there are a lot of practices from cognitive behavioral therapy to meditation that, like gameplay, allow you to decide that not all thoughts and feelings require you to engage with them and that you – you can choose That's which funny. ones you want to engage with. So let's dive into that idea of using games to not to self-medicate, as you put it, or to escape, but to be um, purposeful or productive in some way. How do we know the difference? Can you give us some examples? Mm-hmm. So for the Super Better book, I did a meta-analysis of almost 500 peer-reviewed studies looking at how gameplay affects your real life wellness. And looking at these studies, you'll find that half of them say things like video games lead to depression, gameplay linked to social isolation, video games correlated with poor grades, more likely to use drugs. And then the other half says exactly the opposite. You'll see studies that say frequent video gameplay linked to greater happiness, stronger relationships, less drug use, better grades in school, more career advancement. And they're all great studies. They're all peer-reviewed. And the the really puzzling paradox for many game researchers and game designers over the past decade is how do you make sense of this, this divergent body of research? Right, yeah. And it turns out that the number one indicator – of whether you will go down the track of games are not making your life better, maybe they are having a negative impact on your mood and your performance in your real life versus games are making you better and you feel empowered and you have better relationships. The one difference between those two paths is whether you see games as not being meaningfully related to reality. Mm. Do you think that games are an escape? Are you a different person when you play? Are you in a different reality when you play. If you look at games that way, then you tend to use them as a crutch. You are not able to bridge the gap between a game world and your real life challenges. And so the worse that your real life gets, the more you play games. And it's this downward spiral, not good. And I guess for me, like I'm hoping that you can help me understand this, is that I have never um, not played a game to escape. Um, Mm -hmm. Long time listeners here know that I had an issue with two dots. I have to admit that I found a sort of similar puzzle like game. I don't even know the name of it. It looks like Tetris. It's about like building these long lines of blocks. And I found it Mm -hmm. incredibly relaxing. But also I played it while I was on a long vacation with my entire extended family. And part of it was like, Get me mentally the hell out of here. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go put these blocks together. And I took it off Mm -hmm. my phone when I got back because I could see that any time I was, like, tired or stressed out, I wanted to play the game. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there is a lot of great research to suggest that you can play these very convenient video games for very short bursts, change your state of mind, change your mood, give you more physical energy, and then bring you back to your everyday life in a more positive state. And so what I try to do around games like that is share with people what the research says and encourage you to set a timer, play for that duration, and then go back to the rest of your life Mm -hmm. with this improved focus or this zen-like state. And the amount of gameplay time is 10 minutes for certain effects and 20 minutes for other effects. So if you're trying to calm your mind and body and return to the world with more mindfulness, 
20 minutes is the amount of gameplay time that's recommended. If you're just trying to stop an anxiety attack or if you're ruminating on thoughts that are making you really upset and maybe you're replaying a conversation or something uh, traumatic that happened, 10 minutes of gameplay is recommended for that. Mm -hmm. 10 minutes is recommended for squashing cravings. So if you're trying to not eat something or not smoke, studies have found that 10 minutes of certain types of games, exactly the type you describe, like Tetris or Two Dots, are really effective for that. But you have to know what these doses of gameplay are, and then you have to try them out the same way that you would, you know, when you take two ibuprofen, Hmm. you're not going to take 20 or 200, you self-regulate. And and so if you try self-regulating with gameplay, you'll find that you can have a lot of benefits. I mean, is this kind of the new self-help in a way, this idea of using technology and the knowledge that we have about how our brains work to sort of change yes. our mindset? Yeah, absolutely. I, mean, I think if there's been one gift to humanity from the world of video game research, it has been that we better understand now a lot of ways that non-pharmaceutically we can alter our brain state and then we can alter our mood. And that is a gift. It's very similar to a lot of spiritual practices or traditional wisdoms, but it's a tool that we can use. And it's affordable, and it doesn't have side effects. But also, you can self-experiment. You can play this, you know, Japanese cat collecting game that I really like. You know, uh, Katsune. I've heard about it's, it. It's it's so cute. Um, maybe that's your game because you like collecting little cats. Um, maybe you want to, you know, blow things up. Whatever. Um, find your game see what its effects are. There are strategic things you can do with them, and it is very much, I think, in the line of self-help. You actually did make a game that helped you to bounce back from this horrible concussion you had. Are you still doing that? Can you give us examples of other things that you're building right now and how they might help people? Sure. Yeah, well, that game, Jane, the Concussion Slayer, that's what became super better, um, which, you know, I renamed it because people started adapting it for things other than concussion and they were using it to try to get over bad breakups or lose weight or find a new job and and all sorts of things. And that simple set of rules that I created for myself to giving myself quests to do each day and connecting with allies and uh, having a notion of power-ups that I could collect and bad guys I could battle, that became an app that still exists and almost a million people have used it to try to tackle real life health and depression and anxiety and the personal changes they want to make. So a lot of my listeners have written with questions about um, being worried that their kids are playing too many video games. How can a parent Mm -hmm. then tell the difference between what is actually something that they should let their kid do and something Mm -hmm. that they really should put limits on? Ask them this question. What have you gotten better at since Mm -hmm. you started playing this game? You don't want to hear things like, I got better at slinging this virtual bird or I'm really good at using this kind of power up. That's literal. That's too concrete. But abstract things like, I don't give up when things are tough or I am willing to try lots of strategies. I'm I'm super creative in that way. If they can talk about these abstract things, those are skills and resources and abilities that persist in their mind outside of the game world. And you as a parent have a really important role in cultivating that mindset and cultivating that identity. The two things you need to do are, one, do not shame your children about the games they play. Never say something like, stop playing and go do something real or stop wasting your time and do something that matters. Because when you say things like that, You're sending them down the other path, the dark path that we don't want, where they think games have nothing to do with reality, where they don't Mm. matter, where they're trivial. Don't shame them about games or they will develop that escapist mindset. Instead, you want to talk to them about, you know, wow, that level looks hard. You know, what kind of skills do you need to be good at that level? And ask them what they're getting better at. That conversation alone can really transform a young person in terms of, their ability to bring all of these gameful strengths to school, to sports, to their 
personal relationships and to their self-concept. So do you believe in the concept of being addicted, quote unquote, to games? You know, addiction science is going through an incredible radical reinvention right now. If you look at the past decade, we started to believe that certain substances were addictive, like cocaine or heroin, and they did something to our brain and they kind of broke our brain. And then we started to look at technology as being like an addictive substance. But now the sort of disease model of addiction is going away. And the prevailing wisdom is that addiction is just the brain working the way it needs to work, the way it's evolved to work, to be goal-oriented and motivated to achieve positive outcomes. But it gets stuck on one particular stimulus. Mm. And for some people, that stimulus is a physical substance like a drug. For some people, it's a person when you're falling in love. When you become a new mom, your baby is that sole goal that you are focused on and the reward loop of the brain gets fixated on. Some people do get that loop fixated on video games. That doesn't necessarily mean that there's anything wrong with your relationship with that piece of technology. What you need to do is you need to expand your brain's awareness of other things that activate it in the same way. Mm, So video games are challenging problems that you wrestle with and you get to be creative and you get to learn things and collaborate with others. And if you think that's what's cool about video games, not how escapist they are, but all of these cool things you get to do, that will activate the brain in the same way as a video game and you'll be drawn to it and you'll have goal orientation that expands beyond the game. So that's that's what I recommend uh, individuals who feel addicted to games do. So can you give me some examples of like specific games and maybe what they can do if we play them with purpose or with a positive goal in mind? So I guess I'm thinking of like Minecraft. That's Mm -hmm. become sort of the epitome of this idea of a creative game that parents Mm -hmm. feel they don't need to put limits on and that it's positive. What are some other examples of ones? Any game that is genuinely challenging is a wonderful game to develop these skills and abilities you know, esports is a really popular thing now. These games that are incredibly strategically challenging and also require a lot of real time coordination with your teammates and fast thinking and fast decision making. So, games like League of Legends, any game like that has these benefits because what you're really trying to do is build up your ability to wrestle with things that you don't understand and to experiment and to get learning resources that you need and get mentored and keep trying and don't give up when it's hard and get better. Even the shoot 'em ups like Call of Duty or something? So I don't personally play games where I have to try to kill creatures. That's just not my thing. But for people who are drawn to those games, There is uh, quite a lot of evidence that when you play them with people you know in real life, whether you're on a team or you're playing online with friends, there are so many benefits in Mm -hmm. terms of the strength of your relationship, your ability to process a lot of information quickly and make better decisions under pressure faster. So there's cognitive benefits, there's social benefits. We don't see those benefits In the first-person shooter world when you are mostly playing against people you don't know. And that's because there is one negative effect associated with it, which for shorthand you might call it testosterone poisoning, (laughs) um, which – which means that you're, when your opponent in a game is somebody who you don't know who they are, you kind of anonymize them. And this is the same thing that leads to flame wars on the internet and a lot of you know, vicious trolling. When you don't know the other person, you're not going to have any social consequences for being a poor sport when you win. It creates a set of emotions um, that kind of jack up your testosterone, make you more unpleasant to be around for hours afterwards, less kind people that you perceive as weaker than yourself. You're more likely to be insulting or aggressive. And this continues after you've been playing. Hmm. Um, So I always say if you love these games, you need to spend at least half of your time or more playing with people you know. So on the opposite end of the spectrum, or at least in my mind, is something like Candy Crush. Have you ever used that? Do you play or used it? Played it? (laughs) Have I used it? I'm on level 
894 or so. Woo, uh, have you I, used it? I play for probably five minutes every day. I mean, I think I have been doing that for several years now. I often do it at night before I go to sleep, which is counter to a lot of popular advice that you hear now, which is put your phones away for at least 45 minutes before you try to go to bed because the blue light from the phone yeah. interferes with sleep cycles. I don't find that to be true for myself. Um, I use the game to turn off. So I'm, you know, I'm a relatively new mom. I have 18 month old twins. They keep me busy all day, even when I'm trying to work from home. They go to sleep. <laughs> yeah. They're asleep by like 730. Then I go right into work mode, work, 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 busy, 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 getting everything done, totally excited, yeah. planning. And then I have to go to sleep. And so I have to get my brain switched from, you know, super productive planning, slightly anxious because that's how I work best mode to not having thoughts in my head about work and what I have to do. And so Candy Crush is one of those games. Yeah, it's a transition and a level or two of that. And my brain is effectively switched away from things that might otherwise have me, you know, lying awake, planning Jane McGonigal, thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Okay, copy fairly closely in creative mode for this video, with the most notable difference being the added cart track to try and make this build a bit different. I understand if that part of the design totally isn't for everybody. I'm trying to put a cart in as use as often as possible. And I can say that projects like this one were a fantastic challenge, even if it did involve quite a few hours of remodels and, uh, and more remodels. Most of the time, I'm just asking, why did I do this to myself? But in total, there are a glass floor spa, the go-kart starting zone, an indoor zoo with camping area, and four passenger bedrooms. Two of them have jacuzzis in room. Each comes with their own deck. The top floor is a restaurant, which is connected to a ballroom complete with piano laid into the floor. I finally get another chance to use that little fun toy from the game. Top deck is a pool, jacuzzi, and assorted seating areas. The rear tier of decks is a continuation of the restaurant on the top and viewer seating area for the go-kart track on bottom. The bow has a trampoline to bounce on with plenty of clearance surrounded by a park themed for kid passengers. Of course, there's the captain's cabin area that goes up in the small riser with the jacuzzi for one of the poshest views on the vessel. It's something neat to have against the skyline of San Francisco up there in the background. This is opposed to the original, which was built in story mode on the island that opens up in the fourth year of the game. Considerably different scenery between the two builds and a handful of other similarities like the glass bottom spa. The original contains a couple more passenger rooms and a whole lot more food options, but it also has the more plain exterior, minus the track, so people can get a better view of what the project can look like without that feature. Let's get some good pan around views here and a little bit of view of the amenities.
And now we're back on creative mode. This entire server is getting filled up with assorted builds. The majority of the center section is taken over by the track and its accommodations. The aisle with the large waterfall has become basically the Bay Area, which, funny enough, means the raceway is approximately correct correlation to the Laguna Seca Raceway in the northern tip of Central California. Not that I'll probably carry on with the unintentional California theme here, it was just too much time on my hands and a lack of any other creative thoughts of things to make in Garden Paws. Well, except at Winchester Mystery House, I might have to find a location appropriate to stick it in and it could turn into a weirdly monstrous build. Conceivably there's a few more boat potentialities with slight modification to this. Definitely the back end could use some trimming and tucking on a future build. But we'll see if that sailboat look can be pulled off too. Look out for those future builds, take care all, and thanks for sticking around! Bye! -bye.